Good afternoon and welcome to IT Governances and Softworks webinar on seven cyber security risks and how to overcome them. We will be starting the webinar in about in a couple of minutes just to give some time for um, some late attendees to sign in and log in. Um, in the meantime, I would just like to sort of remind people that uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available afterwards. There are some handouts available in the handout section on the control panel, which is normally on your right hand side. If you would like to ask any questions as we go through, can you please write them into the question section in the control panel and we will try and answer them at the end of the actual uh, webinar. And while we're waiting just for the last few people, for a few more people to join in, I would uh, just to sort of remind people that uh, we will be emailing you with, uh, with the presentation as well uh, after this uh, webinar has finished. So it it does look like we've got a reasonably good attendance. I can see the figures uh, clicking up. Um, we are going to start the webinar. But just as a reminder, um, we will be sending out certificates of attendance for this uh, webinar, which should allow those who need it to be able to claim uh, one hours of CPE for attending the, the, the actual webinar. So good afternoon and welcome. My name is uh, Garrett Williams, and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the GRC International Group, which is the parent uh, company for IT governance. I've been at uh, been the CISO for the the last two years at uh, GRC. Prior to that, I've had uh, uh, over 15 years worth of experience in cybersecurity from a very technical background. Um, I built my first computer by soldering components onto a circuit board back into the sort of in the 80s. These days, I actually uh, work on sort of Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and other small form computers and turn them into hacking tools. I've been CISP qualified for more years than I would like to actually recall. And as I said, I've been a, a PCI QSA and an ethical hacker and sort of led the formation of IT governance's technical services in uh, ethical hacker hacking in the early years of uh, it, the service offered by IT governance. So that's a little bit about myself. And let me pass you over to Adrian, who's my co-presenter today. Thank you very much, Geraint. I'm Adrian Becker. I'm the technical director for Softworks, and we are very much been working with Microsoft for the last 20 years. And as Garen said, started life a long time ago, like himself in computers, when for some of the individuals who might remember it, Windows 3.1 and earlier. And that is for the people that's probably as gray as myself attending this webinar today. But we've, we've been very much been working with organizations from 50 seats right up to um, 10, 20,000 at executive level, helping them understand how they can improve their security and also how a Microsoft can help organizations achieve their business goals. So a little bit about IT governance and GRCR, GCR uh, International Group. Uh, the group consists of a, a number of sort of companies some of which you may be familiar with. We have our sort of publishing, the IT governance group, GRCI law, our e-learning division, Vigilant Software who produce our sort of uh, VRISC software and cyber comply platforms. Uh, we also have a DQM GRC who are specialists in uh, governance and privacy and operate a seeding system to actually monitor data and we have gdpr.co.uk a website to help uh, educational establishments mainly with um, matters around gdpr so we've um, helped over 500 uh, organizations with uh, compliance and risk management 
we have uh, put through over 600 clients for ISO 27000. So we've delivered, and most of you are probably familiar with, uh, a lot of our services. Soft, Softux is uh, the UK's leading Microsoft Cloud Security Specialist, so we very much promote a Microsoft-first approach uh, and use utilizing what you've invested in to secure your environment and achieve more um, with your investment. And we work very closely with IT governance because at the end of the day, we implement a lot of the security, but as I, as I always like to tell my customers, you can't mark your own homework. And that's where we work very closely with IT governance to help with the process procedures and ensure that customers are following the right compliance. And hopefully today work, you know, you'll find it very informative and seeing how a partnership between Softworks and IT governance can really help you, the organizations. So for those who are not that familiar with uh, IT governance, we consider ourselves to be a GRC one-stop shop, covering all the requirements around government's risk management and compliance. We will help you with cyber, uh, with cyber resilience, uh, governance and risk management. Uh, we can help you with data protection, GDPR, cyber security, cyber essentials, and ISO 27001, whole range of standards around cyber security and information security, including the PCI DSS incident response activities. So as you can see from the slide, there is a large number of activities that we can help with, whether you just want some or all of the services, or you can actually get them from us. Everything from consultancy, technical security, training and qualifications, software tools and books and toolkits. So on to today's agenda. I will be covering the top seven cyber risks and the impact of a cyber attack on a business. I'll then talk about some of the common attack methods um, in context of the sort of COVID-19 and what's been seen this year in particular. Adrian will talk about the um, cloud security tips to reduce risk of cyber threats. And I will then carry on and talk about the cost and ramifications of a cyber attack and how to educate your staff to prevent and reduce the impact of cybercrime. Just to sort of set the scene, um, a lot of organizations, especially small businesses, tend to think that cybercrime will affect the larger organization, that there will be some form of protection from, uh, from cyber attack by, being, uh, by obscurity. And Studies have shown, and the UK National Cyber Security Centre has said that as an SMB, there's a one in two chance that you experience a form of a cyber security breach. Attackers these days, they are looking for the sort of the easy touch. They're looking for where they can actually get the return on investment for the effort they're putting into an attack. And then often these days with large organizations having dedicated security personnel, and the budget, they are now going after the SMBs, the small businesses, as they don't have the dedicated personnel to actually fend off some of the very sophisticated uh, challenges to actual cyber security. So there are a number of attacks, examples such as the HMRC VAT deferral scam, uh, scam that's been running that is deliberately targeting small organizations. And Beamin, who are an organization that provide uh, uh, network activities and other uh, support to small businesses, have been monitoring the volume of cyber attacks. And since August, uh, 2018, there's been an increase, a big increase in the average number of cyber attacks per, on UK businesses, with the reaching around about 60,000 attacks in uh, the latter half of uh, 2020. So these cyber attacks, um, they're based upon a number of vectors and in our opinion, a small business, the big, the top seven cyber risks are the sort of the following ones. They're not in any particular order. It really depends upon your organization as to which may be the top risk for yourself. 
but all organisations are going to actually have these seven risks that they need to look into and cater for. Uh, in my own opinion, probably everyone needs to be aware of the phishing and the business email compromise attacks. These are a form of social engineering, attacking businesses through the email, bypassing a lot of these sort of technical controls like firewalls on your perimeter, getting to the users within your organization and trying to get them to actually do something. Open an attachment, visit a website, send back some information. So a business email compromise, they're actually impersonating CEOs, uh, finance officers, other important people within your organization and requesting uh, people to do something for them uh, very quickly to transfer money to a, a client, etc. And a number of organizations have lost a large amount of money through such attacks. So there is the sort of social engineering uh, attacks under sort of the phishing and business uh, email compromise attacks. There's also the risk from weak passwords and password reuse. The NCSC published some guidelines a couple of years ago about uh, the use of passwords, what makes a strong password, how best to sort of implement controls around that. They gave guidance on the use of password vaults. It is very important that organizations make sure that users are using strong authentication methods, that they are using good passwords, strong passwords, and that they're not reusing them on multiple accounts. Your work password should not be the same one that you're using on your sort of personal uh, activities. A, a lot of attackers will harvest emails from lists that are sold on the dark web and actually use them in credential attacks uh, to see if they uh, can actually gain access. So there is a risk from the actual uh, poor controls around passwords. One of the features of 2020 and of the sort of uh, 2019 as well have been the development of ransomware attacks. Every week there is announcements of a new ransomware attack that's actually encrypted data at an organization that they've no longer been able to access it and either have to spend a vast sum of money on actually rebuilding their systems and restoring data if they can, or paying the ransom to actually the criminals to see if they can actually get the key back to decrypt their actual um, uh, data. So malicious software and ransomware in particular are big risks to any organization, especially with a sort of small organization where you may not have actually put in place all the necessary controls around protecting the, uh, your backups, etc., from being uh, encrypted by the ransomware itself. The next risk I want to talk about is patch management. All software tends to have undocumented features, vulnerabilities, bugs that need that are patched and updated by the vendors and distributed. It is important that organizations implement those patches and updates as soon as possible. Critical and high vulnerabilities need to be patched within sort of 14 days for cyber essentials. But if you fail to patch, it's even a vulnerability that can be exploited by an attacker. A number of times this year, there's been actually a release of a update, a notification about a particular vulnerability in the software. And within days, the attackers have reverse engineered the patch, worked out how to actually attack the software and launched attacks before organizations have, been, have actually patched their infrastructure. So patching as soon as practical to protect yourself is an important part of actually reducing the risk to yourself. Our attackers are looking for vulnerable bits of software, vulnerable appliances on the actual internet to which they can actually then try and exploit and get into your organization. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the cloud vulnerabilities as Adrian will sort of cover that a little bit later in the talk. But you need to actually, with the increasing use of cloud within organizations, software as a service, platform as a service, it is important that organizations know how to protect 
and what controls, the best practices they need to follow to make sure that their cloud infrastructure is not vulnerable. And you need to get the insight within your cloud infrastructure the same way that you get the insight within your own perimeter of your physical network. With the insider threat, a lot of people will actually think about the malicious insider, the person stealing data, exfiltrating it, maybe because they're leaving the organization or got the grievance against the organization. But a lot of breaches and, uh, occur from people accidentally emailing data to the wrong uh, recipients. And there's been many ICO fines issued against organizations because of employees of that organization doing something and releasing data accidentally. It's not a deliberate one, but it's an accidental release. It's an accidental breach, but you can still get big fines from the ICO for those activities that occur. So insider threats are a big risk to all organizations and including the small ones. And ensuring that your employees know how to do their job and reduce the accidental uh, breaches will help protect your organization. And finally, I'm gonna sort of talk about the risks from insecure configurations. There are a lot of um, devices um, that an organization need to deploy, firewalls, there can be sort of cloud uh, virtual instances that you may want to actually deploy. All these come with default configurations that need to be configured to meet your security proto proto profile. If the configurations are not so secured and default passwords are used and default security settings are, are used, attackers know these and can leverage them and exploit them to actually get into your organization's uh, infrastructure and get to your actual data. So from our point of view, the top seven cyber risks are these ones. And if you put your effort into these, they will cover the majority of threats to your organization. So over the last year, we've had COVID-19 and there's been a lot of tax based upon social engineering and the term COVID-19. A lot of phishing attacks, a lot of business email compromise attacks have been launched by attackers taking advantage of the situation with remote workers working from home, along with a, a lot of concern about what is happening. There's a lot of confusion from the government, a lot of uh, changes. People trying to keep up with those changes are vulnerable to actually clicking onto email lures that uh, seem to give them information, but actually will compromise their machine or get them to supply information that can help their organization be attacked. So there's been a lot of social engineering attacks during the using COVID-19. There's also been a lot of attacks around password reuse. There are uh, uh, silos of data on the dark web, which consist of all the credentials that have been discovered by attackers. They've been sold on, they've been released, and attackers can take those and use them against your system. They can replay all the credentials, they can replay the passwords to see that if somebody's used the password elsewhere, can it be used against your systems and get you in? As somebody's personal email address, personal uh, password, is it suit, can it be, have they used it at their organization? So there's been a number of password attacks. And finally, a feature of the last year, of this year has also been the remote access infrastructure. The NSCS, the NCSC in the UK and the NSA in the US end of last year highlighted a number of vulnerabilities in a number of VPN products. These vulnerabilities were being exploited by attackers to get into organizations. 
they have all been patched, but there is still a large number of VPN appliances, VPN servers, etc., remote access infrastructure that contain these vulnerabilities. And with the rush to get people working from home, a number of remote access solutions were deployed that had not been updated and patched, allowing attackers the opportunity to scan for uh, those vulnerabilities and then exploit them and gain access. And there's been many a case of ransomware getting in this year through vulnerabilities in the VPN. So over this year so far, they have, these are probably some of the most common attack methods used in the breaches that have been reported. Attackers, especially those who are doing phishing, are always very quick to respond to the latest news. And you can see from uh, reports uh, from March onwards, the use of COVID-19 terms in phishing emails uh, soared as attackers use that as bait to get people to click on uh, links, to open documents, to visit websites. Attackers are always going to use the latest uh, news bulletin as a lure. So it's been COVID-19, there's a lot of phishing emails going around at the moment around the US elections, and come towards the end of this year, there'll probably be a lot of phishing attacks that are gonna be using Brexit as a, a lure to actually for the, for the actual attack. So social engineering has always been a successful way to get into an organization. And it's often quoted that around about 80% of all successful breaches resulted from some form of social engineering or phishing attack. I'm now going to pass over to Adrian to, to, for him to discuss about cloud security. Thank you very much. So the plan really is to look at how you, what security tips you can implement to reduce your risk of cyber threat from a Microsoft perspective. And I do apologize to the organizations not running Microsoft, but, but we found that the majority of businesses tend to use some sort of form of Microsoft at the moment in their organization. And as we've introduced ourselves, we are the Microsoft security specialist. So we're gonna try and address some of these risks from a Microsoft point of view, because what we have found is a number of organizations don't actually realize that a lot of the tools that they need, they've already paid for, it's available and leveraging your existing investment and just configuring and turning on the features can help you reduce these risks. So hopefully what I'll cover in the next few slides is how we can address those risks. But if I want to start off, the standard approach that all organizations should take, no matter who they work with or what technology they use, is to work on a zero trust approach. And a zero trust approach is a process of taking cues from the elements around you in re real time to enforce policies and security on the environment. And this has to be extended not just on the internal network, but from your whole environment. That means your users working from home, your users accessing your data on phones, etc. And on the zero trust approach, there's really six areas to think about when you're looking to secure your environment is who is the user? How do I really know that it's Adrian that's trying to log in? What devices am I coming from? Are these devices compliant, encrypted, secured? Am I, are they allowed to go in? What data will they all be accessing? What information are they looking at? Should this be um, enabled? What applications can be accessed? What data can be accessed within those applications? What's happening with my infrastructure? Is it behaving in a different way than I would expect? As we just mentioned, is the number of hacks, breaches happening, is extending. And what, what can I see on my network? What is the vectors or the information being fed through? Is the device behaving abnormally what I wouldn't expect? Should we stop the device from continuing access? It's having this real life 
information feeding into your organization and into the, uh, your systems that you need to monitor. So have that zero trust. Don't trust anybody just because they're sitting on the inside of your firewall or they've connected securely over your VPN. As Garen just mentioned, we've seen significant um, breaches and vulnerabilities in the existing environment. Next slide, please, Garen. So hopefully what we're going to be showing you is how you can actually protect them uh, against some of the risks that was identified. So we talked about weak password, uh, passwords or password reuse. Our view is you've got to have two-factor authentication or a multi-factor authentication method where you don't really rely on the password anymore. And having that done, you can do it through various areas like hard tokens, soft tokens, using keys, using biometrics. But our advice is you've got to turn on some sort of form of multi-factor authentication. And if you look at what the National Cyber Security Center said is that cloud solutions, cloud emails that rely on passwords has been breached and is being breached quite regularly. And regularly and even in our organization we see customers who hasn't adopted MFA being breached quite regularly because the users tend to use the same password as mentioned for their for their office login as they do to sign up for a free coffee from a well-known coffee shop and that gets hacked and suddenly they've got full access into your organizations and my advice is do not use Office 365 or any other cloud-based email system if you haven't turned on MFA because you will be breached. Next, please. Then we talked about the phishing and uh, business email compromise attacks. And what people don't realize is that there is tools like um, Office 365 Advanced Protection, or as it's now called Microsoft Defender for Office 365, which will look at emails coming in. Does it contain potentially phishing links into it? Does it have safe connections? But also, what's happening when somebody sends you a message on Teams? Because Microsoft has sort of promoted Teams. It's been highly adopted. I think last time I saw about 75 million net new signups in the first three months of the year at the last report, but organizations realize it's available. They realize this might not be locked down and send links to your users to say, click here and we've got some interesting information and in the process they're harvesting your systems. But also look to turn it on to look at viruses that's potentially being uploaded into your SharePoint, your Teams, et cetera. And I think the big part is people don't realize and they just assume that they have some sort of anti-phishing um, protection, but this is not the case. It's not available directly out the box. It's a service that should be turned on and configured. Next, please. We then talked about some of the malicious software ransomware, and I think this is where, which is quite interesting. A lot of companies out there at the moment will tell you, buy our antivirus solution, it's the best, or have a look at doing, uh, put this on and you're 100% secure. And I think the message is, there is no such thing as being 100% secure. It's just not possible. If the Pentagon can get hacked, we spend billions in what chance do small businesses have? And I think as we just saw from the statistics, it is a significant threat. So, by, but by leveraging things like Windows Defender, combined with Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection, you can really start protecting your environment. And I remember, if I roll back about five years, Microsoft was the laughing stock of the antivirus world and everybody thought it was quite funny to bash them. But right now, if you look at Gartner, they are now number one. They have changed so much over the last few years and we're finding that the security has improved significantly and compared to most vendors out there, they are now the market leader. But again, people don't realize it and they don't realize it's actually built into most of your Windows environment, most of your systems, because what the system will do is not just antivirus, but actually look at the behavior of what's happening on that machine. Are we seeing strange behaviors? Is a potential markers that says um, permissions are being elevated? Are we seeing, for example, that there's cross 
data being leaked from that workstation being transmitted. So suddenly you could not only get traditional malware protection, but you're actually getting inside a threat where your machine's being compromised or breached, you get this telemetry information. And where you have worldwide attacks breaking out, for example, attack starts off in Australia, very quickly you'll be notified that which of your machines potentially have vulnerabilities or exposed to the particular attack. So be aware that it's available, be aware that it's included and built into most of Windows 10 these days and can't be turned off. All you need to do is turn it on or sort out the license. But again, worth taking a look from a point of view because it's already there and available. Next, please. We then talked some of our risk management around patch management. And again, a lot of organizations don't re realize that you actually get endpoint manager as part of your systems or part of a lot of the subscriptions. But what this enables you to do is to manage and monitor your devices no matter where they are. No more are you reliant on your device being in the office or connecting securely across a VPN back into the office to get updates or to see what the status is. Your machines, it's being monitored constantly and can be managed no matter where it is for, for security and compliance. But not only that, you can see, understand what software is installed on that machine. Has it been patched? Send out new updates to the system. Send out only software that is needed to that system. Is it encrypted? Has somebody decrypted that system potentially or trying to, to compromise them? system and it can be extended as well to your mobile devices, virtual machines, embedded devices and servers. What what Microsoft has actually done is provide you a method to send out your patches and manage your software no matter where your end users are. So no longer are we reliant on the end users coming in, especially now that we've got 14 days to apply security updates or enforce some sort of form of changes or emergency patches, as Garen said. We have the ability now, especially where we've got that with COVID. Thank you. Now, cloud vulnerabilities, and this is a big subject, and I'll be honest, there is so many of these that you can be out there. Now, the common ones we normally see is um, remote desktop services 3389. We've opened up a port for an engineer to do a little bit of work and we forgot to close it behind us or somebody's forgot to close it behind it. And some of the big breaches we've seen, for example, over the last few months is rumored to have been caused by the 3389 breach and it's affected millions of users. And uh, there's a specific charity or um, provider that it's rumored to have this was the reason why they had a breach even though they got every certification and SOC security you can think of unfortunately the human error of leaving a port open but by leveraging technology like Azure Security Center or as it's called Microsoft Defender now for the cloud is a good way to understand what's happening because what it will do is monitor your service on premise or in the cloud to look at what ports are open, which ports are open but not currently used or only occasionally used, so why are they open in the first place? Analyze and get a baseline of security for you. For example, what is the minimum security standard? Have you encrypted your database? Have you actually encrypted the disks that the system is on? Have you turned on local guest access or local admin rights? Are all the security patches being applied? Are you following your own procedures? Do you need to provide just-in-time access to certain systems and network on the environment? So really, Microsoft has made available for relatively low cost a way for you to monitor these services so, because they, they do it on a daily basis. They've got millions and billions of attack vectors coming in, engineering information being fed into the system which they can then run through their artificial intelligence, leveraging the technology and providing you with just the right information you need to improve your security. And we have seen where we've implemented this, the surprise and the shock on a lot of the customers we work with, who thought the environment was secure and then finding out a lot of information they never realized existed. And 
a bit to be fair on some of the developers out there they there to write software to get it up and running quickly to provide the services to the business they don't always think about security and it's an afterthought but as mentioned if you suffer a breach accidental breach or not it still will potentially cause a fine from the ICO if it's personal no, identifiable information that get leaked. So please have a look at the security center. We then talked about some of the insider risks and uh, I think this is quite interesting is that Microsoft has actually got an insider risk management um, system that they've made available which will help you understand and look at user behavior inside the system like have users accidentally started forwarding documents that they shouldn't should we enforce a policy around those leaks or actually take an example a practical example i download 50 documents friday night i come in on monday morning and i resign um, that probably should be investigated by one of the compliance officers or the legal office because why would I download 50 documents Friday night because most likely I'm going to a competitor and I wanted to take a lot of sensitive information with me. But also what is a, what I would call insider risk from a uh, potentially from lawsuit point of view. A good example is offensive language use, bullying, um, sexual threats potentially. And what a lot of, people don't realize if you use a lot of the software like Teams or um, a number of other systems that's available, those messages that you think is private is actually kept indefinitely. And when there's a subject access request, that information needs to be retrieved and gets handed over. And I worked with a large enterprise not too long ago and I told them that and I think there was a horrified look around the table and the first job was to go and delete all previous conversations older than a week because I think even the people in the room was horrified because probably more personal discussions took place than it should have done. And it's quite interesting when you start talking to people from a practical point of view. But I think the view here is there's too much data, there's too much information available. You need to have utilize some of these systems to help you deal with that. And not all users are malicious, as was said. It's the accidental, I'll just send this email on, oh, I didn't realize it contains a person's home address. I'm sorry, put my hand up. I didn't even read further down the, the message. I just wanted to forward it on to a colleague or to an external party to do an action. So I think that that's one of the areas to really concentrate on and know that there is ways that technology can help. And last slide, please. And then we talked about the insecure configuration. And this again, we bring it back to the Microsoft Defender ATP Azure Security Center. What this will do is look at the baseline, look at your systems, understand have you actually configured it correctly? Have you actually looked at it? Have you thought of it? And what is really different, it analyzes the potential threats that the system have and the potential holes in your defense. And what we have found is by implementing the security, by being able to run ATP to show you what potential patches are missing, potential software that needs update, or potential configuration changes that's not been implemented, just improves the security of your environment significantly. So the key message is all of the risks out there can be mitigated by adopting a Microsoft first approach. It's not to say Microsoft only, but I think as Gartner said not too long ago, it's great having the best product in each of these different areas, but they don't always talk together. You need an army of people to get it all to work together seamlessly and keep it running. Whereas leveraging your existing investment with what you've probably already bought, you can configure this and be a lot more secure moving forward. And that's, thank you. Okay, thank you, Adrian. So what I would like to do is actually just talk a little bit about the cost and ramifications of um, cyber attacks. Now, a cyber attack on an organization can result in an oops moment where we shouldn't have done that, or to actually situations where the business will actually uh, have to be liquidated as it's no longer viable. There are many studies that actually sort of show that uh, the cost of a, a breach is in the millions. Um, they sort of taken into account the very large organizations. There's also been studies that actually show 
that um, breaches um, of small companies will cost 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. And it's not just the sort of the cost of that. A malicious insider can and has actually caused organizations to sort of fail because the controls were not put in place to actually prevent someone who was unauthorized from accessing and deleting the assets of an organization. So this is a case that's been reported this year, a businesswoman um, who deleted thousands of important files from a company and that company then went on to collapse as it could not replace those documents that had been lost. There, hadn't, there wasn't any sort of backup in place. So the cost can actually sort of vary. The impact can vary from a slap on the wrist to actually uh, potentially sort of failure of the organization. So during 2019, the average cost to a small organization was about 11,000 pounds, according to some of the sort of studies that I've sort of looked at. But these do not necessarily cover all the costs that uh, you would incur during act, uh, an actual breach. And again, not all these costs are actually going to be retrievable through cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is a good thing to actually have, but it would only repay for you to get back to where you were. It would not pay for anything they consider to be an improvement beyond that position. So the purchase of new equipment, new firewalls may not be covered under cyber insurance. So the hit on a small business can be very big, even with uh, just the small sorts of costs in sort of tens and twenty uh, thousands of pounds. One of the things that I would like to sort of mention is the business email compromise. These are increasing. These are where attackers are impersonating senior people within the organization and asking for people to actually transfer money. And the average loss to a small UK company, according to Lloyd's Bank, is around about £20,000 per uh, scam. So the way these work is that your employees will receive an email from maybe uh, the, your CEO saying, look, I'm in a meeting, uh, I can't really be disturbed, but can you do this for me? I need it done urgently. Can you transfer 50,000 to this account? And I need it done in the next half hour. And a lot of people trying to be helpful will actually do this. So, you know, Beck accounts have increased dramatically. According to Lloyd's data, it's, it's increased over 58% over the, over the last year. And a lot of these actual uh, attacks do not get report, uh, reported. Interestingly, sort of the report did say that law firms were affected, uh, most affected followed by HR, IT workers, and sort of finance uh, companies. So what can a SME do to actually reduce the actual risk from a, an attack? The first thing is actually to acknowledge that your bis business is at risk. There is no such thing as obscure security by obscurity. It is a, not a question of if you'll be attacked, it is when will you be attacked. Attack. That attack may be just phishing emails, it may be just a back attack, it could be a ransomware attack, but you will be attacked. And if you don't have the policies, the processes and the technology in place, that attack can be could be successful. So once you've actually acknowledged that you are going to be attacked, you need to put in place a, a cyber security strategy. You've got to look at what your risks are, what are the likely threats to your uh, organization, and put in place, place a strategy to protect those resources. And potentially, and one of the, sort of the issues with small organizations have been they, they don't actually have the, um, the expertise in hand. It is actually possible to outsource this type of activity and get help from teams of skilled expert professionals. You need to put the security where you need it. 
you need to know what are the crown jewels of your business. Where are they? What sort of level of protection do they have? And you need to put the controls around them. Cyber criminals are very good at knowing where the valuable data is stored, potentially even more than, your, than your, you do yourself. So you need to identify where your information is and then put the appropriate controls around that uh, data, around your crown jewels. And probably one of the most important things is to train your staff because the majority of attacks will target the human error. So training people to recognize the attack and how to respond correctly are very important. So the quick wins are cybersecurity training for your employees, making sure they under recognize an attack and know what they need to do when they actually find uh, one of those attacks taking place. You can train them to, uh, uh, to detect phishing emails. You can actually instill in them the culture that if they're not sure, ask someone, get a second opinion. They can also, you can also turn on the technology within your licensing for Office 365. You've probably already paid for your license for the license. Take advantage, get a better return on your investment by turning on the controls that come with what you've purchased. So turn on safe links, safe attachments within Office 365. Give your staff training so they know how to do their job. They know how to actually do the configuration. So that they actually know what they need to do to safeguard your organization. Look at your password policies. Look at the NCSC guidelines. Turn on multi-factor authentication. Make sure people are aware of what a strong password is. There is a difference between complex passwords and strong passwords. And the NCSC advice gives really good guidance on, on identifying and creating strong passwords and the use of password vaults, etc. So understand your password management, follow the best practice from people like the NCSC, Microsoft, et cetera, in, in getting your staff to protect their passwords. Increasingly these days, it's about making a backup of your, your data and keeping it secure. There is no point in backing up your data to a file share on your actual server. So you have a copy on the workstation and you have a copy on the file set, on the file server as, that's shared. Because ransomware will actually scan the workstation, it will scan the network, it will find backups that are actually connectable but across your actual network. So backups need to be secure. The need to have uh, to be offline, away from direct connection from um, workstations so that they will not be deleted or won't be encrypted by malicious software and uh, criminals. You also need to actually patch and update software and firmware. A lot of browsers, a lot of software, a lot of operating systems would do a lot of the patching automatically for you. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the tools that are built into things such as the Microsoft licensing. It is important that you use supported software and software that's not gone beyond end of life. Often end of life software has vulnerabilities in it that are not being patched and can be easily ex ex uh, exploitable. And follow the controls within the cyber essentials. It's a government scheme, it's a baseline, it's a very simple cyber hygiene uh, um, program to protect you against the majority of low skilled attacks. And a lot of the attacks that you will face will be those low skilled ones. So cyber essentials covers about protecting your infrastructure, making sure you've got a firewall between your equipment and the internet. Even if it is a single laptop, you can have a firewall on that laptop that will protect it from the internet. So protect your devices, your end user devices from threats on the uh, internet by having a firewall that's properly configured 
uh, between yourself and the, the attacker. Change the default security and password settings if, you've, if they are set already. Make sure you are using best practice on actually how to configure those devices. Control who has access. Only allow authorized people to data and systems. Restrict the use of admin and privilege settings to those who need it when they actually need it. Not everyone in your organization needs access to everything. Keep it to the minimum. Protect against malware. Turn on that anti-malware protection that's actually in the operating systems and turn on the protection services within your email and web browsers and keep everything up to date. Use supported software, install the patches. Don't use anything that's beyond the end of life. Additionally, make sure you encrypt data while it's stored, whilst it's been transmitted and back it up. Organizations run on data, you need to protect it. Encryption is a good way of doing this and making sure you've got backups and backups of your backups. Ensure that one of your backups is actually offline so it cannot be uh, reached by ransomware and other malicious software. Finally, I really want to sort of, uh, before going on to a more, bit more about staff training, I just want to say about reporting cybercrime. In the UK, all cases of cybercrime should be reported to action fraud. If you do have a financial loss, get in touch with your bank at the earliest possible time. If you've got a cyber insurance, get in touch with them as soon as possible because they are often have very good advice and give you access to advisors who can actually help you with your with the actual situation and if personal identifiable information has been compromised under gdpr if it's going to cause harm to those affected you must report it to the rco so i just want to move on before we run out of time i quickly cover a bit about staff training it's important to train your staff to reduce the risk. You've not only just got to tell them what to do, you've got to tell them why you're actually doing it. Otherwise people feel that uh, you're putting restrictions on what they're doing and sometimes they will develop their own workarounds. If you explain to them why they need to, you need them to do something some way, sometimes they'll come up with even better ways of actually protecting the data and information. So train your staff about cyber risks and it will reduce the vulnerabilities. You need to improve their awareness about social engineering, improve their knowledge on how to work securely. And they will also um, be the first, uh, they will also be able to help you improve detection. They will help you, you they can recognize the attacks and they can actually respond and report attacks to you. Quite often, your employees are considered the weakest line of defense, but they're often the best and first line of defense and detection. They can be an asset to your organization and not a vulnerability if you train them properly. And that means not just getting them to do the same e-learning training year after year. Make sure it is varied up to date and use a different a mix of uh, learning tools, uh, styles and communications to cover everyone's diverse needs and preferences for the way that they actually learn. So you need to raise awareness, give them the relevant knowledge and skills. You've got to encourage the transfer of skills within the workplace, make sure the training is bit successful and reinforce it through awareness and best practice. You've got to create through training, basically a human firewall. As I said, employees are often described as the weakest link, but they're also one of the layers and they can be one of the greatest assets in actually detecting and reporting about attacks. You, may, you can turn on all the AI and all the efficient technology within the various Microsoft um, technologies, but you still need your staff to be trained to catch the ones that slip through the net. Microsoft are very good, but no system is perfect. The multiple layers that you have, the better your cybersecurity profile will be. 
So what I want to do is just to give some key takeaways from this talk about training, which is training, making sure that uh, they are trained and when they are trained, they can be your best asset. Make sure they're aware of what the cyber threats are and what they need to do, and they will became, become your sort of best and last line of defense. Protect low hanging fruit by implementing cyber essentials and also implement the tools that you're paying for. Get a return on investment, leverage your existing Microsoft subscriptions, use what they have built, turn it on, and understand how it works. And these are sort of the key things that we want to get across to you today. So just to finish off, um, at IT Governance, we offer cybersecurity as a service with a dedicated specialist to help you address your cybersecurity challenges. We do staff awareness e-learning courses that are updated quarterly that can be combined with simulated phishing attacks. And we've also gamified uh, a number of our sort of awareness courses to make them more interesting and help with people's sort of understanding uh, the attacks and what they need to do. And we have another webinar next week about cyber incident response readiness for SMEs. Thank you very much. So just from a software's point of view as well, go and download our uh, Microsoft Security Insight Report. Join the security, our cloud security community. We'll get regular updates and information. Um, you also, by attending this session, you can have access to the Microsoft Discovery Workshop. You can just follow the link below and get on board of the regular webinars where you will discuss a bit more uh, how Microsoft can help organizations and specific various technical solutions that can be implemented. Okay. Just to sort of finish off, um, you can contact our IT governance through our sort of normal channels. Details of these are actually in the slides that will be emailed to you and you can download from, load from the handout section. And there's also details on how to contact uh, Adrian at Softworks as well. And again, that will be in the uh, handouts and in the emails that we will send to you. We've got just a few minutes left. I um, apologize for the amount of talking that we've done, uh, but I'll see if there's actually any questions that have been asked that uh, we can actually answer uh, in the meantime. So I'll start with one of the first questions that came in. A customer of ours has received an email where the domain name was changed. A G was replaced by a Q to look like a G. It looks like they intercepted the sales invoice and changed the bank account details. The customers paid their outstanding debt into a fraudulent account. Is this an attack on us or our customer? Well, it, that is classed as a spoofing attack where somebody was looked like it's coming from one domain, it's actually coming from a different domain. We, I'm not a lawyer, so that's the first disclaimer I'm going to say. And um, But from a point of view, it looks like it's an attack on your customer at face value and there will be questions that should be asked to the bank is how how did they able to set up this fraudulent bank account why was the money allowed to be transferred how did they pay money into this different account i don't know if it's the first time they've paid into your account but what is their process and procedures when bank account details do they pick up a phone to normally verify that or not um on the other part, what I do need a bit more information and understanding is how did they actually get hold of this invoice that they managed to change? How did they intercept this invoice? Was it a legitimate invoice? Because it could be that it's a potential attack on both organizations where the information was done. And I have, I have seen this before. We've been through this with a customer where they actually legitimately did breach one person and it ended up with lawyers to try and decide who's liable from a point of view, but there needs a bit more investigation to understand. But at face value, it looks like um, the, your customer was the victim of a spoofing attack. Um, Geraint, I don't know if you want to um, answer that in any different way. I think basically my answer would sort of echo what you said. It, it really looks like it's an attack on your clients and also potentially um, attacking your, yourself where someone has actually stolen um, uh, or got hold of a sales invoice. 
that could have been from yourselves, that could have been actually from another one of your customers, et cetera. It's, without a lot of details, it can be sort of difficult to judge. But uh, these type of uh, attacks uh, are very common, especially with the sort of spoof the actual uh, domain name. Uh, I would uh, probably suggest that um, normally when I see um, an email compromise uh, attack, it's just where you are compromised and your uh, an email chain is then taken over and used to send out, the domain name won't be changed because it, uh, they want to pass the SPF and DMARC and DKIM um, protection that's on emails. So I think potentially is they've got hold of a sales force and sales invoice with your uh, details on it and then sent it to one of your customers using a spoofed email domain. So it's primarily an attack on your customer. Yes, and I, it is maybe that they've just spoofed the email and it, the domain didn't really exist. So I think it was opportunistic. And the question is, how did they get hold of that valid invoice and know that you sent? It might be that um, one of their accounts is already um, internally been compromised, potentially. We've seen that before where somebody's got access to, into their account they understand what is being sent out. They then intercept that or create rules to change it in the background and then engage with your customers. But I think the, it needs a bit more investigation to really understand what's happened, where did it come from? And, and as I can see, you mentioned that it happened within four hours. Um, it sounds potentially like it might be a multiple attack, but I would have thought if they had access to inside your system, they would send that compromised bank details from your actual legitimate um, email address because we've seen that before as well where they actually change the, intercept the email in your own system change the details on the pdf and then or the invoice and then continue sending it on to the customer from a legitimate email address which makes it a lot harder to prove then who's who's at fault okay i think the best way of doing this is potentially uh, we, our contact details are actually in the uh, handout. If yeah. you want to further discuss this, I think it'd probably be best to take it offline and actually have a bit more of a, uh, a private discussion around it. Absolutely. And but I think, thank you for that question. Uh, absolutely. And, and then I think one of the question is, how do we defend our organization against phishing attacks? As we said before, implement some sort of um, advanced threat protection to stop spoofing phishing use of either third party technology or turn on which um the technology that you have in your current mail provider system or purchase a third party solution okay uh i noticed our allocated time is uh up um i would like to thank you for um your attendance uh, as I sort of said at the beginning of this, this has been recorded and we'll give access to that afterwards. We will be sending out a certificate of attendance so that those who need it can actually claim a CPE point. Um, the handouts were available actually uh, within the actual control panel, but we will also be emailing them out as well. But uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and we will look forward to actually uh been in touch with you uh in the future thank you very much everyone